Do the Falcons want to stick and pick and take the top defensive player at eight, or does it make more sense for them to trade back? You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. And guys, if you don't know me, I'm your very humble host, Aaron Freeman, aka Mr. Drew, aka Serious Black, aka the Jolly Green Giant, aka Mr. Aka, and of course. Been covering the Falcons for far too long, formerly at Falcons.com, RIP. Still going strong on this illustrious podcast, and I appreciate each and every one of you that is an everydayer. And all you got to do to make this podcast your first listen or first watch of the day is subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. So today's episode, I am going to be joined by Max Chadwick of PFF, who covers college football. We'll talk a lot about the Falcons draft fits talking about, you know, not only their options in the 2024 draft class, but also maybe, you know, some positions and some needs like safety, like quarterback that may make sense for the Falcons to wait until 2025 to fill those issues, because that's one of the insights we get from Max covering college sports that he can kind of stack and compare both draft classes as opposed to most of us who are only focused on the current draft class. And then at the end of today's episode, I'll also swing back and break down the Taylor Heineke restructure and whether or not that, you know, contributes to the possibility of the Falcons taking quarterback this year or waiting until next year, next year. But let's jump into that conversation with Max Chadwick of PFF right now. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of Locked on Falcons. And of course, I am joined by an illustrious guest. He is none other than Max Chadwick, the top guru for pro football focus when it comes to all things college football but if he's an expert on college football, you know he has a little bit of insight into the NFL draft. So Max will be joining us to share some thoughts on some players that may be on the Falcons' radar, may fit well with what the Falcons are looking for, especially in the early rounds. You know, no one cares about day three draft picks, none of that stuff. So Max, my friend, welcome to the show. Aaron, thanks for having me on, man. I really appreciate that. I don't know if I deserve that uh, that intro that you gave me, but uh, I'm excited to be on nonetheless. So, Max, let's 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 start with, you know, the the big conversation when it always comes with the NFL draft is like, who who is your team going to take in the first round? What player are you going to draft that's going to save your franchise and and set them up to win championships for the next decade versus uh, if you whiff on that pick, then, you know, it completely derails all hopes and dreams for your franchise for all of eternity. At least that's how fans like to frame it. But. The Falcons are often being mocked a defensive player with the eighth overall selection. And a lot of people sort of assume that that may be the first defensive player off the board. Yeah. And I guess if that is the case, you know, who is the player or players in your eyes that kind of stand out that should be in the mix to hold that honor as the top defensive player in the 2024 NFL draft? Yeah, it's interesting. You, 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 I'm glad you made that uh, distinction that it would be the first defensive player because I remember you go back to the 2021 draft and the first seven picks that year were offensive players. That actually set the record for the most picks in an NFL draft without a defensive player getting selected. I, I think we're going to tie that record this year. And I, if Atlanta doesn't take a defensive player, I mean, I, I, we could even break that record, honestly. So, um, yeah, I think some of the guys, I think right now, if you look at the betting odds uh, on various sports, sports books right now for the eighth overall pick, the favorite to be selected there right now by a pretty good margin is Dallas Turner, the edge defender from Alabama, obviously a freak athlete, um, pretty productive player for Alabama, but I, I'm not quite as high on him as the eighth overall pick or something like that. Um, so I, I personally would not take him there, but if I had to make a prediction as to what the Falcons will do, and actually I have a mock draft that I'm doing, uh, it's coming out on Monday for PFF. Uh, I, I'm going to put Dallas Turner there at eight. Cause I think that's kind of where they're leaning right now, but obviously corner is another way where they can go. Guys like Quinion Mitchell, uh, Terry on Arnold, uh, that kind of, you know, could be an option for them there as well. I love Layatu Latu, the UCLA edge defender. Uh, if you're going to take an edge at eight, I would take him at number eight overall. Uh, but right now, if you had to, if I, you know, gun to my head, I would probably say Dallas Turner 
is who I would predict the Falcons are going to take at number eight. And I think based off of that comment that you just had of, you know, if they take a edge, if they take a defensive player, is, is that guy kind of worth the eighth overall selection? You've seen a lot of recent talk about the potential for the Falcons to try to trade back that if uh, another team wants to come up for one of those, you know, offensive, you know, superstars, whether that's, you know, a tackle, a quarterback or a wide receiver. Uh, do you think that makes sense for the Falcons if if they're kind of settling in on taking a defensive player and passing on one of these offensive players, um, you know, trading back if they can move back three, five spots or more? Does that make a lot of sense to you? It does to me, uh, because I think, I, you know, when you're doing these mock drafts, there's a guy like Roman Dunze who consistently falls out of the top eight. And I could see a team being very desperate to get ahead of the Chicago Bears at number nine, who I think would take Roma Dunze if he falls there at number nine. So there could be a team that needs a receiver, like maybe the Steelers or or someone else that really desperately needs a receiver, or even like the, the Chargers, for example, who could trade back out of five and then um, try to get back up to get Roma Dunze because they desperately need a receiver as well. I could see a team that really, really needs a wide receiver saying, hey, we got to get Roma Dunze because there is a big drop off between Roma Dunze and probably Brian Thomas Jr., who's wide receiver four. Uh, they could want us to do that because the team right uh, behind you guys, the Chicago Bears, would be uh, running that pick in, honestly, I think, if Roma Dunze is there. So I could see that happening. I don't think J.J. McCarthy is going to fall to number eight. So I don't know if a quarterback needy team will move up for, say, a Michael Penix Jr. or a Bo Nix. Um, but if there is a team that wants to move up, I would probably say it, it makes sense for the Falcons. Cause like I said, I, I don't know if there is a defensive player that I would take at number eight overall. Um, so I, I think it would make sense for them to move back and uh, grab someone maybe in the teens uh, to fill out their defense where I think it's more valuable. And then obviously you pick up more picks as well. So yeah, I, I think the the likeliest of that scenario is a team moving up to grab, say like a, a Roman Duse probably. So I, I guess Max will uh, ask you this. Um, if you know that wide receiver is there, do you think it's smarter for the Falcons to move back and let someone else come up and get, say, a Roma Dunze? Or, you know, do you think the Falcons can do the thing that they've been doing the last couple of years and take another offensive skill position player with a top 10? I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that sort of alternative option. I would see what the offers are out there first. I would not be opposed to taking Roma Dunze. I don't think that's a bad call. I wouldn't. I would never hate on the Falcons for taking a guy like Roma Dunze, who I think is a top ten player in this class. Um, it is an interesting fit because they have so many jump ball guys already in that offense with Drake London, uh, even Kyle Pitts, and then obviously you add another one in Roma Dunze there. Uh, but I mean, you're surrounding Kirk Cousins with weapons. I don't hate that at all. Um, but yeah, I, I would certainly listen to the offers first because I, I do think, I mean, like I said, there is a huge, huge drop off between the top three receivers in this class and everyone else. It's still a really good receiver class. I could be wrong, but the top three in this class are like wide receiver ones in almost any other draft. Uh, so I could see a team really desperate to uh, to move up to get Roman Dunes and get ahead of Chicago Bears to take him. Uh, and they could pay a premium for that. So I think Atlanta, with so many needs on the defensive side of the ball, I think Atlanta would be wise to at least listen to some offers. And if they get a really, really good offer, I, I think I probably would move back uh, and get some more picks out of it. So there's still more to come here with Max Chadwick of PFF, and we'll talk more about the day two options as well as the Falcons' decision to potentially wait on a quarterback in uh and wait till next year's draft and we'll break that down as we continue today's locked on falcons spring is here and baseball is back and game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace for major league baseball which makes getting tickets even faster and easier prices on the game time app actually go down the closer you get to that first pitch and with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game time is taking the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. Flash deals allow you to save with exclusive in app deals on select seats ahead of the game. All in pricing means that you can toggle this feature to show total upfront. So you're not going to get hit with hidden fees at checkout and the seat views. Of course, you're going to get that panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. So you know exactly, you know, what type of foul ball or you know, pet pitch or whatever that you may be able to catch in the stand. So take the guesswork out of buying your major league baseball tickets with game time by downloading the game time app, create an account and use code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase terms apply again, create an account and redeem code locked on NFL L O C K E D O N N F L for $20 off download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. 
Now, I'm here with Max Chadwick of Pro Football Focus, and we've talked a little bit about the potential options for the Falcons in round one. But, of course, the draft is seven rounds, although I, I know a lot of fans don't seem to think of it that way. But, you know, we're not going to get too deep into the weeds, Max, here, you know, with some late round options. But I do want to pick your brain on maybe some day two options, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, it, it, let's you know, say hypothetically, if the Falcons did pull the trigger on a wide receiver like Roma Dunze in round one, you know, who are some options for them, especially at some of their key critical needs on defense, like edge rusher, cornerback, safety, that you like as sort of day two options where they can, you know, circle back into day two and and, and still fill some of those needs. Yeah, so I think uh, I think edge and corner are the two needs that they have uh, biggest on, on defense right now, and. Um, I, I do think wide receiver is still a need. Don't get me wrong. So again, I, I would not hate Roman Dunze if they ended up did taking him um, at number eight overall. But yeah, if they're at 43, um, it is tougher to, to find, you know, guys you're really get excited about um, at, at edge and corner because usually those guys go in the first round. But still, I think there's some still guys you can get like Chris Braswell and edge defender, the other edge from Alabama. Honestly, if you don't take talent, Dallas Turner, I don't think Chris Braswell would be a bad pick at number 43 overall. I don't think Braylon Trice either. I will really like Braylon Trice a lot. The Washington edge defender, I think he'll probably be there as well. Uh, then you look at the corners in this class, guys like Ennis Rigstraw Jr., Kamari Lasseter, TJ Tampa. Those could be guys that I think um, the Falcons could be looking at with that number 43 overall pick too. So, uh, yeah, if they do take Roman Dunes at number eight, which, again, I would not hate, uh, then I would look at the number 43 overall pick and and their future picks as a ways to to fill out their defense and more specifically uh, grab guys at probably the most at the two most valuable defensive positions in edge defender and corner. Now, you, you talked about, you know, this deep wide receiver class. Let's say the Falcons go kind of chalk and, and take that defensive player in round one. Who are some day two options that you, you like at that wide receiver position that won't quite make the impact that Roma Dunze uh, will have, but, you know, could be pretty good additions to this Falcons offense? Yeah, like I said, it's, it's a loaded receiver class. It's why I'm kind of leaning defense for them in the first round, just because, like, yeah, you miss out on Roma Dunze, sure, but you can still grab a really, really good receiver uh, in the second and third round. Whereas, you know, you look at the edge and cornerback class, it kind of drops off significantly after the first round. So that's why I kind of think they're going to lean defense in the, uh, with that number eight overall pick, or even if they trade back in the first round, I still think they'll probably take a defensive player. But you look at guys like, say, Lab McConkey, I think he'd be a really, really nice fit in that offense. It just gets open at will. Um, if you really want another jump ball guy, Keon Coleman might be available there. Um, I, again, I don't love the, the fit there for Atlanta just because he's another – bigger um a little bit slower receiver kind of like drake london too who's go, goes up against it like I, I think there's a little bit too repetitive in that offense but keon coleman would be a fun fit just have like another basketball player out there in that offense uh troy franklin is another guy who seems to be slipping on draft boards i'm not really sure why uh he's a guy i like a lot too um xavier leggett from south carolina another bigger receiver so yeah there are definitely options for the the falcons there jalen polk's another guy that i think is getting underrated right now there's a lot of receivers out there for the falcons that they can look at uh on day two um and that's why i probably lean uh going receiver on day two and day three rather than uh getting roman dudes at number nine and then you know having some pretty big holes on defense to fill on day two and day three now the falcons you know bringing Kirk Cousins at quarterback. They're retaining Taylor Heineke as their backup and ship off Desmond Ritter to the Arizona Cardinals. And the new coaching staff held by Raheem Morris has already mentioned that they want to bring in more competition behind Kirk Cousins. And obviously given Kirk Cousins age, his injury history uh, or recent injury history, you know, that may not be a long-term solution for the Falcons. And so it makes sense for them to maybe draft a quarterback now and, and stash that guy for a couple of years. But Max, because you really cover college football, I think you're, you know, positioned to have a little bit more insight into this than your typical draft analyst who's only focused on this year's draft. But I'm curious, when you look ahead to the 2025 draft, right? There's been a lot of talk about, you know, every year during the draft, it's like, is next year's quarterback class better or worse than this year's <laughs> quarterback class? So I'm just going to ask you sort of if you're a team like the Falcons and you don't have this sort of pressing need to to take a swing on a quarterback because Kirk Cousins presumably is going to be here for two or three years. You know, Taylor Heineke's still locked up for another year. I'm curious when you're looking at the Falcons, when you're looking especially at some of those day two and day three options at quarterback this year, do you feel like, Hey, let's definitely get a guy now because you know, we know how good this crop is, or do you think, you know, next year's draft class, 
may not be as big a drop off as maybe some people are suggesting it. And you can potentially wait there. I'm just curious, where does your mind go when it comes to that quarterback? Yeah. So I think it's a good question. I think I would, if you really want to find your quarterback of the future, and obviously you're not going to spend a first round pick on it. Um, I would wait because I, I just don't, I mean, you can get a guy like Spencer Rattler say, yeah, I know the Falcons have a couple third round picks of 74 and 79, um yeah i think they, they can grab him there maybe michael pratt you can grab somewhere around there too i just i'm a little queasy about saying oh that's our future right there i don't know if they will be the future of, of the franchise um and next year's class i will so actually funny enough I, i'm doing this series for pff where i'm ranking the top 10 prospects at every position if everybody in college football was eligible to be selected this year so um you got the 2024 draft guys in there you got the 2025 nfl draft guys in there and even some 2026 nfl draft guys in there if, if they uh have really impressed in their freshman years and in terms of the quarterback rankings i had carson beck from georgia as my number four quarterback behind the top three of this year um of caleb drake and Jaden daniels and then i had guys like shador sanders at number six um it's it's not a great class next year i will say is a pretty big drop from from this year um but there are options like like shador sanders like carson beck like uh quinn Ewers, uh jackson dart uh drew aller i think has a lot of potential from penn state as well uh i just i don't know it's, it's tough for me to say oh let's let's wait until a third round and, and grab someone that we want to stash for the future like maybe spencer rather and michael Pratt can both become starting caliber quarterbacks but i i'm just I, i'm not there with them yet and uh i think they're more maybe backups uh so i, I just if, if you're the falcons fan and you want to find your quarterback in the future i i don't think it's worth you know trying to find one on in the third round i think it's probably worth waiting and, and see what you can get in the future makes sense makes sense um and, and speaking of that series that you're doing i know the falcons you know potentially could use an upgrade at the safety position and i uh, correct me if i'm wrong I think you you listed the top 10 eligible safeties in both years and only one from this year's class is in that top 10. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I have, so the article hasn't come out yet, but I, uh, I'm i starting to do some preliminary work and putting together the list for uh, every defensive position. And the safety class, first of all, the safety class this year is like, it's not great. Uh, it's probably one of the weakest, if not the weakest position in the entire NFL draft right now. I like Tyler Newbin from Minnesota, but after that, it is a mosh posh of guys. And, you know, take your pick after that. Uh, next year's class is going to be ridiculously good. I think Malachi Starks from Georgia is probably the uh, the number one safety right now. Um, Kevin Winston Jr. from Penn State is another guy I really like. Xavier Watts, uh, one defensive player of the year in college football this year. Even though I don't know if he really deserved that award, but he still had a really good year for Notre Dame. Um, yeah, it's a really good safety class next year. Uh, Xavier Nwankba from uh, from Iowa. And then obviously, I mean, you got 2026 guys too, like uh, Caleb Downs uh, uh, from uh from now Ohio State, from Alabama, and Dylan Thieneman from Purdue that I also love. So, uh, yeah, there's a chance there's only one 2024 safety in my top 10 right now, uh, and we combine all the drafts for the next three years. So, yeah, that is – I think safety is one of the strongest positions in college football next year with how much returning talent there is. Okay. Well, that's going to go into my formulation of whether or not the Falcons take a safety this year because Richie Grant, who they drafted in the second round a couple of years ago, this is his contract year. Maybe they want to give him another shot to see if he can prove it under a new coaching staff. And so if you're sitting there saying that next year's safety class is stacked, mm -hmm. I, I, it, it certainly makes sense from my perspective that the Falcons, okay, let's run it back with Richie Grant one more year. We just drafted DeMarco Hellams, give yeah. him a push. Maybe, maybe we'll get a guy on day three or something that can add some depth there. But, you know, let's see what next year has when it comes to maybe finding that long term answer, you know, next to Jesse Bates. If if, if she carries doesn't step up, is that uh, a fair way to look at it? I think it's a very fair way to look at it. Yeah, I think that's kind of why I wanted to do this all eligible series is because like like you said, there's always people who are talking about like, oh, next year's class is so good. Next year's class is so the grass always seems to be greener or the grass seems to be non-existent at all. Uh, because sometimes you're like, oh, it's so terrible. So my goal of, of this whole series and why I'm doing it um, is because it's a guy who loves college football and loves, you know, evaluating these guys from freshman to junior and senior years. Whereas like guys like you, who I'm sure, you know, you guys cover the NFL, like you, Trevor Sycamore, guys like that, you guys cover the NFL day in and day out. You don't have time to watch, you know, 2025 and 2026 guys as someone who really uh, watches college football mainly 
that's what I wanted to do is kind of like, okay, let's take a peek behind the curtain and say, okay, what do the 2025 draft look like at this position? What does the 2026 draft even look like at this position right now? That was the goal of this. And I know obviously these lists are going to look laughably bad in two years when you're looking yeah. at the 2026 rankings. You're like, oh my God, how the heck did you have this guy? Or how is this guy not even on your list? It's going to look bad. But at least right now, it's kind of like a, a good preliminary look, I think, of looking at the position. So yeah, safety, safety, uh, and then also running back. I know there's kind of a weaker running back uh, draft this year. Next year's running back class looks like one of the strongest I've ever seen, honestly. So uh, I, I think those are two positions right now where I'm like, hey, if you don't feel comfortable taking a guy this year, next year's class is going to be a lot better at it. So it might be worth waiting a year and uh, grabbing your guy then. Well, uh, obviously, I think those are good articles uh, that you guys could check out at PFF.com. And I guess my last question for you, Max, on that same note, I've heard, you know, running back safety, also linebacker is a, a down crop this year. Is that going to change next year or are we just going to have to live in a world where just linebacker may never be a, a position of strength ever again uh, in the <laughs> NFL draft? Where, where are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, man, it, it seems like it's an epidemic, doesn't it? At the linebacker position in, in, in football, honestly. I'm not even going to say NFL. In NFL, college, like it seems like. It's like, okay, we have a couple stars, but after that, man, it's it's tough. Because I think I think a big thing that goes into it is that it's so hard to play linebacker nowadays. You know, before in the old days where, when teams were running the ball a lot, it was like, okay, you've got to be a, a big, strong guy. You could defend the run. Now, if, you're, if you can't play in coverage now, you're a liability. And if you can't rush the passer, you know, you need to have some semblance of being able to play in coverage really well, being able to rush the passer occasionally. And then also you still have to be a really stout run defender. So I think it's, it's harder than ever to be a linebacker in today's day and age. So um, yeah, looking ahead to next year's class, there really isn't that many guys to get like over the moon about one guy that I really do like is Harold Perkins, uh, the linebacker from LSU. He is a guy that is an excellent pass rusher. They kind of played him in, in the wrong spot this year. Kind of like um, I love him as a pass rusher. And I thought he could be like a Micah Parsons esque player. He's a lot smaller than Micah is, but he's so good off the edge that I thought, okay, maybe he might be able to play full time edge in college. Uh, he kind of plays an off ball role. Still was really really good in coverage, but I think he was kind of limited uh, in what he could do for LSU this past season. So I still like him, although it is still kind of projection of what he could be as an, a pure off ball linebacker. Uh, and another guy I really like is Barrett Carter from Clemson, who would have been one of the top linebackers in this year's draft. He kind of shocked everyone when he decided to return to Clemson for his senior year, but he's another all around stud uh, for the Tigers. And yeah, those are two guys I like, but it's not like I'm like over the moon over about them as I am for other positions on, on the defensive side of the ball, specifically uh, in next year's draft. So yeah, I, I think it's a good point. I think it's just the way the game is now. It's so hard to play linebacker that you're just not seeing, you know, absolute superstars at that position as much as we have in the past. Yeah. Definitely. So uh, I could talk with you all day about this, Max, uh, but we will leave it there. Uh, go ahead and plug, you know, some of the more stuff that you're working on, as well as some of the stuff that you dropped recently on PFF. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I've seen all my articles live at PFF.com. If you want to go check them out, you can follow me on Twitter at Max Chadwick CFB. And then also I host the PFF college football show with my uh, my buddy Dalton Wasman, who also works at PFF. Uh, covering everything college football. Right now we're covering everything NFL draft. We're actually, uh, I think in a couple weeks, we're going to do an all eligible mock draft. So everyone in college football is eligible to be selected uh, in the draft. And I can tell you right now, I think the Falcons will be taking an edge defender, but that edge defender will not be coming from this year's draft. There's an edge defender in next year's draft that I think could be the number one overall pick with how, uh, how weak of a quarterback class it is. And I think he's going to be available there for the Falcons at number eight. So, uh, Keep an eye out for that because I think it's coming in a couple of weeks. Absolutely. I definitely look forward to that. Um, you know, as you, as you say, like, can only at this point in time focus on the 2024 draft. But as soon as we get through like May, it's like, ooh, well, <laughs> let, let, let's get excited. You know, it's like a kid on Christmas. You know, who's going to be the stars of next year's draft class? So mm -hmm. I always look forward to that sort of pivot at that point and always appreciate people like you that can sort of give me that early preview into that pivot. Uh, but Max, really appreciate you joining me on today's uh episode and uh thank you again and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get you back on in the future and then maybe talk a little bit more about the 2025 prospects and whatnot yeah absolutely aaron thanks so much for having me on man so guys we still have more to come on today's episode including breaking down taylor heineke's reworked contract and what does it exactly mean for the falcons future plan at the quarterback position it is april and it means we have a fully loaded sports calendar Right. You know, you got 
the Major League Baseball starting up. You got NBA, you got NHL, so much more, right? And FanDuel's making it more exciting for you guys to get in on the action because right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet on the tournament, Major League Baseball, NBA, NHL, NFL Draft, all of that is in store for you over at FanDuel. All you got to do is visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and you can make your first bet a big win. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on to bet on all the staple sports as well as other things that aren't sports related. That's what FanDuel is doing for you as America's number one sports book. So let's wrap up today's episode talking about Taylor Heineke's rework contract. And a lot of this information comes from Mike Rothstein of ESPN, as well as OverTheCap.com, which apparently Taylor Heineke did rework his contract prior to that, I think, March 17th uh, roster bonus. Um, Now, the Falcons still paid that roster bonus, but the Falcons basically were able to lower Taylor Heineke's base salary from $5 million to $1.2 million. They paid that $1.32 million roster bonus. He still has $2 million in leftover prorated signing bonus. So his new cap hit is about $4.53 million, basically cutting his cap hit in half from down from roughly $9 million. So the Falcons are saving a little shy, a little north of $4.4 million. Uh, And this amount of money is just enough to get the Falcons in a position where they could sign their entire draft class um, after the draft. If they want to make any additional moves, they're going to have to restructure other contracts or maybe cut other players. That includes, you know, restructuring, not cuts. Grady Jarrett, Young Way Koo, Jake Matthews, and Chris Lindstrom. Um, so we'll see what the Falcons do on that front, but that's probably going to wait till after the draft. So I think if anybody's thinking, oh, this means the Falcons are going to start making moves between now and the draft, probably not, unless we get word of other restructures uh, down the pipeline. But maybe that is the case. Now, I think this move pretty much... I won't say guarantees Taylor Heineke being on the roster this year, but it's going to be unlikely the Falcons are going to move off of Taylor Heineke. I know we had that conversation last week, I think, with Dave Choate of the Falcoholic, of like the Falcons could move off of Heineke. They still technically can. They'd save about $1.2 million against the cap. That's not really moving the needle uh, for you uh, from a cap standpoint. So unless, you know, they bring in another quarterback that comes in and just lights the world on fire this preseason, which is a possibility, but is probably like, I don't know, 5% 5% chance of that happening based off of what we normally see in, in preseason. I don't think there's any reason for the Falcons to move off of Heineke as their QB2. Now, of course, the question is, what are the plans at QB3? I think the Falcons would want want to draft a quarterback. I don't think they're a lock to do so. And I, I haven't thought that since their decision to basically retain Taylor Heineke, um, that if they were in the market for bring definitely bringing a new quarterback, that they probably would have moved off of Heineke earlier this offseason. Now, I would still bet that it's like, let's say a 50, 60% chance that they do draft the quarterback, but I don't think it's as much of a lock as some people think it is, right? I think they could get a guy on day two. I think if I was betting, it's, it's more likely that they maybe take a flyer on a guy on day three. I also think there's a decent chance that they may not draft the quarterback at all and just sort of dra- sign an undrafted free agent and do what they did with Kurt Bankert a couple of years ago or Felipe Franks a couple of years ago and give that guy a bump in his guaranteed money on an undrafted contract signaling that this is our QB3. And I think the rule change with you know teams not needing to carry a, a third quarterback on their 53-man roster like they did last year where we saw with Logan Woodside, you know now you can bring that guy up from the practice squad um, this year. And so there is no sort of, dire need for the Falcons to get a third quarterback on the roster. And so therefore that's what I think leads to, you know, taking a flyer on like a round six guy or an undrafted free agent that you won't feel as beholding to have to carry on the roster as you would if you t- took a day two. Now, again, maybe they take a day two guy. We know there are going to be four quarterbacks taken in round one. Maybe there's five, maybe there's six. Uh, I don't think that's likely, but it's possibility. Um, and so you have to wonder like, are the Falcons going to be absolutely in love in QB5 or QB6 or QB7, the guys that are most likely be, presumably being Bo Nix of Oregon, Michael Penix Jr. of Washington, or Spencer Rattler of South Carolina to pull the trigger on that guy on day two? Maybe. We'll see. Um, you know, I think a lot of people do their mock draft simulators, and that's leading them to think, oh, we'll definitely get you know Spencer Rattler in round three or something like that. We'll see. But I, I think the Falcons do want to add a third quarterback. I don't think they're a lock to draft one. I think they will definitely add somebody whether it's an undrafted free agent or a late round pick 
And we'll see what happens with the QB3. And again, piggybacking on what we talked with Max, I think there's a better than average chance that the Falcons just kind of punt at the quarterback position. They bring in a body this year, see what that guy has. But, you know, when Heineke's a free agent next year, then they'll feel much more compelled to bring in that sort of young quarterback uh, next year uh, in the offseason rather than this year. But we'll just sort of have to see how that goes, guys. That's going to do it for us here on today's episode. Make sure you tune in tomorrow for your first listen. Where we'll be joined by Tori McElhaney of the Atlanta Falcons.com, making her triumphant return to the podcast. It's been a very long time since Tori's been on the pod. Uh, and so we'll talk off season. We'll talk draft plans, all that in store for you on tomorrow's listen for your second listen today. Check out locked on sports today, locked on sports, Atlanta, 24 seven streaming channels right here on YouTube for free, as well as the free Amazon fire TV channels app. So go check that out, guys. It's all part of locked on podcast network, your team every day.